Shall we pray? Father in heaven, as we study about the final apocalyptic Elijah, we ask for the guidance of your Holy Spirit. We're going to speak about solemn things, things that are too great for our finite minds. So we implore special guidance by your Holy Spirit. I ask, Lord, that those who will listen to this presentation will have open minds and hearts to receive the seed of truth, and that they will take their stand with God's people in the end time. We thank you, Father, for hearing our prayer and for answering, for we ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Malachi, chapter 4, and verses 5 and 6. Malachi chapter 4 and verses 5 and 6. Here God promises that before the great and terrible day of the Lord, He is going to send Elijah to planet earth. It says there, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And He will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Notice that God promises to send Elijah immediately preceding the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now the question is, what is meant by the great and dreadful day of the Lord? What great event is being described with this terminology? Let's go to the previous verses. Verses 1 to 3 also of Malachi 4. And we're going to discover what day is being spoken of here in Malachi 4, 5 and 6. It says there, For behold the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in His wings, and you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. This is the great and terrible day of the Lord. It is a day of the coming of Jesus in power and glory to save the righteous and to destroy the wicked. And so God promises to send to this world Elijah before the second coming of Jesus to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers. Now we need to understand that when the Bible promises to send Elijah before the second coming of Jesus, this Elijah is not a literal person. What was literal with the historical Elijah, and what was literal with the New Testament Elijah, John the Baptist, is to be understood in a symbolic, spiritual way when we get to the Middle Ages, and also to the final apocalyptic Elijah. And so before we continue in our study, I need to share with you certain principles that will guide us in our understanding of the end time apocalyptic Elijah. And I want to share with you this very important principle. In the Old Testament, literal Elijah was sent with a message to literal Israel his enemy was a literal harlot who committed literal fornication with a literal king who had, and the, the harlot had literal false prophets who promoted literal worship to the literal sun god Baal. Now at the end of time, the geographical, personal, and ethnic limitations are removed when we study about Elijah. That means that the individuals in this story now come to represent worldwide 
and spiritual systems that cover the whole earth. In other words, Elijah, Israel, Jezebel, Ahab, Baal, and his prophets all are symbolic of spiritual systems that are found on a worldwide scale. So we need to understand that that which was literal and local in the Old Testament and with John the Baptist is to be understood in a worldwide and spiritual sense at the end of time. Now let's talk first of all about the three enemies of Elijah in the book of Revelation. And of course if you're going to talk about the final Elijah you need to go to the final book of the Bible. That would be the best place to find the final Elijah in the book of Revelation. Go with me to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 19. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 19. I want you to notice that end time Babylon has three parts. The enemies of God's end time Elijah are three. Just like with the New Testament Elijah. Uh, which was Herod, Herodias, and her daughter Salome. In the Old Testament you have Ahab, Jezebel, and the prophets of Baal. In Revelation you also have three. Revelation 16 verse 19. Now the great city was divided into three parts. How many parts does Babylon have? Three. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So notice that in the end time Babylon is composed of three parts. Now the question is what are the three parts of Babylon? Let's go to verse 13 of that same chapter. Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13. It says there, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. How many enemies are mentioned in this verse? Three. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Do you think it's a coincidence that you have three in the book of Revelation speaking about the end time? Absolutely not. Because in the Old Testament Elijah story, in the New Testament Elijah story, in the Middle Ages Elijah story you have three enemies of Elijah. Now we need to ask the question, what does the dragon represent? What I want to suggest is that the dragon in Revelation represents the kings of the world. It represents the civil powers of the world. Notice Revelation chapter 12 and I want to read the last part of verse 4. Revelation chapter 12 and the last part of verse 4. Notice, And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Who is this child? Jesus. Who stood next to Jesus to devour him as soon as he was born? It was Herod. And Herod was a king in which kingdom? Rome. So it was the civil, of, civil power of Rome which attempted to kill Jesus Christ. So what does the dragon represent? It represents Rome in this case. Of course the devil using Rome. Notice also Ezekiel 29 and verse 3. And I'm going to read this from the King James Version because it is more accurate than the New King James. It's speaking about Pharaoh the king of Egypt. And we find this, Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold I am against thee, Pharaoh king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said, My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. What is Pharaoh called in Ezekiel 29 and verse 3? He is called the great dragon. The very term that is used to describe Rome in the book of Revelation. Now was Egypt a civil power? Was Pharaoh the civil ruler of Egypt? Of course. So once again we find the great dragon representing the kings 
of the earth represents the civil power in other words Ahab in the Old Testament was the civil ruler he was the king. Incidentally there's a very interesting quotation that we find in Testimonies to Ministers page 39. Here Ellen White explains the following Kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist. Notice, kings and rulers and governors have placed upon themselves the brand of Antichrist and are represented as the dragon who goes to make war with the saints, with those who keep the commandments of God and who have the faith of Jesus. So according to testimonies to ministers, what is represented by the dragon? Kings and rulers and governors. Are all of those civil rulers? They most certainly are. So the dragon would be equivalent to Ahab. It represents the civil power. Now what about the beast? In our last lecture we studied about the beast, which ruled for 42 months. The same as the little horn, time times and the dividing of time. The period of the church of Thyatira, the fourth church of the book of Revelation, the time that God gave this church to repent, chronological time. We already studied this. Now I want you to notice what this beast represents. Even though we studied it last time, we need to review it. Notice Revelation 13 and verses 1 and 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard, his feet were like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion, and now notice this, the dragon gave him, that is gave the beast, his power, his throne, and great authority. Now what does a dragon represent? we already noticed that the dragon represents Rome. The power that tried to kill whom? Jesus. So it says that the dragon gave to the beast, according to this verse, he gave his power, his throne, and great authority. Now here's my question. To whom did pagan Rome give its power, its throne, and its authority? There's no doubt whatsoever as you look at history that a power succeeded the Roman Empire and this power was ecclesiastical Rome. In other words it was the church of Rome which continued Rome. It received its authority from pagan Rome. And so the beast that is mentioned here in Revelation chapter 13 represents the church of the Middle Ages. It represents the papal church. It represents that church who is called Jezebel who instituted idolatry in the church, who also fornicated with the kings of the earth as we have studied and thought that it could change the law of God and perverted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now in Revelation 17 we find this same power that is called the beast is called the harlot. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verses 1 and 5. Revelation 17 and we'll read verse 1 and then we'll jump down to verse 5. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. So you have this harlot just like Jezebel and she sits on many waters. And then notice verse 5 and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the what? The mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And so you have in Revelation chapter 17, this system is called the mother, and the mother has daughters, because she's a mother according to scripture. Now we're told that she sits on many waters. What do the many waters represent? Notice Revelation 17 and verse 15. The same chapter explains what the waters represent. It says there in verse 15, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw, where the harlot sits, are peoples, multitudes, 
nations and tongues. Question, is this harlot a worldwide global system? Absolutely. Are we talking about a literal harlot here that sits upon literal waters? No. The harlot represents an apostate church. And the waters upon which she sits represents multitudes, nations, tongues, and peoples. That means that this harlot, this end time Jezebel, is a global worldwide system. Not one person. And the dragon as we study doesn't represent one king, it represents the kings of the earth and of the whole world. Are you following me? In other words, what happened in Elijah's day and in the New Testament is spiritualized and is globalized. It is made worldwide in its fulfillment. But now we need to talk about that third power. We've noticed that the dragon represents the kings of the earth, like Ahab and Herod. We've noticed that the beast or the harlot is representing an apostate church, the fourth church of Revelation. And that is equivalent to Herodias and to Jezebel in the Old Testament. But then there's the false prophets of the Old Testament, and there's Salome, the daughter of the harlot in the New Testament. Now what could we find in Revelation that is represented by the false prophets of Baal and by the daughter of Herodias. Notice Revelation chapter 13 and verse 11 we have another beast that rises not from the waters but he rises from the earth. It says there in Revelation chapter 13 verse 11 then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb and he spake what? He spake like a dragon. Now let me ask you, this second beast of Revelation 13, whose bidding does it do? Every, well the devil, yes, but he does everything the beast tells him to do. He makes an image to the beast. He imposes the mark of the beast. He commands everybody to worship the beast. Everything he does is with reference to the beast. Do you see the picture here of the Old Testament? What did the false prophets do? Everything Jezebel wanted. What did Salome do? What her mother wanted. And in the end time this beast will make an image to the first beast. In other words, it will be just like the first beast. It will do the biddings of the first beast. And by the way, in Revelation 13, this power is called the beast that makes the image or he's called the false prophet in Revelation chapter 16, but in Revelation 17 the name is the daughters of the harlot. Because the harlot is a mother. Which means that the mother must have what? Must have daughters that sometime in the Middle Ages, or, or close to the end of the Middle Ages, were born from her, and in many ways they practice the same things that she practices. They keep perhaps the same day of worship for example. Now who are the daughters of the harlot? You know I say this respectfully, but you read for example the writings of Pope John 23rd and Pope Paul VI, the two popes that presided during Vatican Council II from 1962 to 1965, constantly in their writings they call the Protestant denominations that were born from Roman Catholicism our separated daughters and they call their church the mother church and they invite the separated daughters to come back to the mother church. Very interesting the terminology that is used. You see during the time that Jezebel governed during the Middle Ages, that the beast governed, that the little horn governed, uh, basically the church used the state like Jezebel used King Ahab. Like Herodias eventually used the king by using her daughter. But in 1798 something happened to this mother system. Something happened to this beast system. What occurred? The beast or the harlot received a what? Received a deadly wound. And therefore she no longer can influence the kings to do her biddings. Do you remember the story of the New Testament Elijah? That Herodias wanted to kill John the Baptist but she could not? 
Who did she need in order to kill John the Baptist? She needed her daughter. And in the same way in the end time this system no longer has influence over the kings of the earth because she has a deadly wound. But we find that this second beast the daughters are going to aid, they're going to intervene to allow this woman once again to use the kings of the earth to accomplish her purposes. Interestingly enough in the story of the New Testament Elijah you have these three terms that are used king, mother, and daughter. And then you have John the Baptist who is called Elijah. In Revelation you have also kings, the harlot mother who fornicates with the kings and the daughters of the harlot. So in Revelation chapter 17 we find the fulfillment of this story. Now do you remember that the Old Testament Jezebel was involved in the occult? Notice what we find in Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 23. This is talking about end time Babylon. I'm not going to read all of the texts from the Old Testament because we've already studied these when we dealt with the historical Elijah. We notice in 2nd uh, 2 Kings chapter 9 in verse 22 that Jezebel was a witch. In other words she was involved in the occult in communicating with the dead. By the way in order to do that you have to believe that the dead are not dead. Isn't that right? You have to believe in the immortality of the soul. Notice Revelation 18 23. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore. And the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, notice this, for by your what? Sorcery, other versions say witchcraft, by your sorcery all the nations were what? Were deceived. Question, is this system which received the deadly wound, whose deadly wound is going to be healed, is it going to try and slay the saints of the Most High just like it did during the Middle Ages? Is it going to pick up where it left off once it uses the daughter to influence the kings of the world? Absolutely. Notice Revelation chapter 17 and verse 6 speaking about the career of this system. John marvels, he says, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So the same as Jezebel, the same as Herodias, wanting to slay God's people. Once again, this characteristic will come to the fore when this power receives its throne once again. Notice Revelation chapter 18 and verse 24. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 24 speaking about this system, Babylon, this harlot system, it says, and in her was found the blood of prophets and saints and of all who were slain on the earth. So we find three enemies of the end time Elijah. The kings of the earth allied with the great harlot who controls nations, tongues, multitudes and peoples and her daughters who do the biddings of the mother to use the kings to persecute God's people. Do you think that God in the end is going to raise up an Elijah to warn the world about this threefold system like the Old Testament Elijah arose to preach and like John the Baptist rebuked this union between Herodias and King Herod? Or do you think God is just going to be quiet and he's not going to say anything about it? We already read in Malachi 4 verses 5 and 6 that before the great and terrible day of the Lord God is going to send what? Elijah. Now is he going to send Elijah in person? No. You remember our principle? Is Jezebel a person in the end time? The harlot? No. It's an apostate church. Are the daughters literal daughters? No. They're the spiritual children, churches that were born from her. Are we ex to expect one literal king? No. It represents the kings of the earth and of the whole world. It's globalized. So let me ask you, what must Elijah be in the last days? Elijah must also be a worldwide global system. Just like the harlot, 
the kings and the daughters are systems at the end of time. In other words, what was literal in the Old Testament and local now becomes spiritual and global or worldwide. Now what will be the message of the end time Elijah? It's found in the book of Revelation by the way. And do you know who that message is targeted to? To the unchurched, right? It's a message that's supposed to go to uh, primarily to people who are atheists, who don't believe in the existence of God. No. To whom did Elijah in the Old Testament primarily focus his message? Israel. God's chosen people. How about the New Testament Elijah? The focus was those who professed to serve God. Upon whom will the final Elijah focus his message? It must be Christendom who claims to serve God but is really in apostasy. In fact do you know that most of God's people are in Babylon and those are the ones that God is going to call out? Notice Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, speaking about Babylon, come out of her my people. So is the message that is given to Babylon targeted to God's people? Yes. Come out of her my people lest you share in her sins and lest you receive her plagues. Question. Is this end time Elijah going to preach the everlasting gospel that Jesus is the one who saves from the guilt of sin as well as from the power of sin? The first angel's message, the Elijah message is found in the three angels messages. The first angel's message says what? I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven having what? The everlasting gospel. Is that what John the Baptist preached? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Is that what the Old Testament Elijah preached? The true sacrifice of the Lamb, the rebuilding of the altar, the true gospel. And it says here that this first angel, this Elijah angel if you please, comes and preaches the everlasting gospel. It says there in Revelation 14 verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Those upon whom the harlot sits, God targets with the message of the first angel. Now let me ask you, was the message of Elijah a message for God's people to come back and worship the Creator? Practice true worship. Absolutely. Is that also in the first angel's message? Notice Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. It says, speaking about this first angel, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And now notice, And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Does the first angel's message call people to worship the true God? Yes it does. By the way, does the first angel's message also rebuke those who are practicing false worship like Elijah did? Yes, the third angel's message says beware to those who worship the beast or his image or receive his mark. Now as I mentioned in a previous lecture, it is impossible to talk about worship without talking about the Creator. We worship God because God is the Creator. And the sign which God has given that He is the Creator is what? The Sabbath. So it's impossible to talk about the first angel's message which calls us to worship the Creator without talking about the Sabbath. In fact the first angel's message makes a direct allusion to the fourth commandment of the Holy Law of God. In other words it's a call for God's people to return to the observance of the Sabbath. Let me ask you, which day of the week do most Christians keep today? They keep Sunday. You see at the end it's not the literal sun that they're going to worship. They're too sophisticated for that. But they worship on the Sunday. By the way, let me ask you, where did Israel get, sun, get, get uh, the worship of the sun god from? Paganism. Where did the Christian church get worship on Sunday from? Paganism. Is there any difference? Not really. Anything that man establishes for worship which God has not established for worship is idolatry. And I've done this before and I'll ask you once again. Who created the sun? 
God did. Did he create it for worship? No. So what happens if you convert it into an object of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. Let me ask you, who created the first day of the week? God. Did he create it for worship? No. So what if you convert it into a day of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. It doesn't matter if it, it's an object or if it's a day. If you make for worship that which God did not make for worship, that is idolatry. So in other words, the Christian world is limping between two opinions. They're claiming to serve the Lord, but at the same time they're keeping the day of the sun which is a direct legacy from paganism. And it's no coincidence that when God makes a new heavens and a new earth, the Bible tells us in Isaiah 66 verses 22 and 23 that we will go from month to month or new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath and we will worship before the Lord. The Sabbath will be once again the sign of recognizing the Creator in worship. By the way, does this end time Elijah also restore the commandments of God? besides true worship and rebuking false worship. Absolutely. Revelation chapter 14 verse 12 which is the concluding verse of the three angels messages it says there, here is the patience of the saints here are those who what? who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. So are God's people going to restore the commandments of God like Elijah did and like John the Baptist did? Absolutely. Are God's people in the end time also going to rebuke the fornication of the church with the kings of the earth? Absolutely. Just like John the Baptist rebuked the fornication between the king and Herodias. Just like Elijah rebuked the union of Ahab with Jezebel at the end of time. This union of church and state will be rebuked. In fact, notice what the second angel's message says. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 8. And another angel, angel followed saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her what? Fornication. And who is she fornicating with? Revelation 17 verses 1 and 2 tells us what her fornication is. What the fornication of this harlot church is. It says, then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me saying to me come I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. So how does she fornicate? With what? The kings. Same as in the past. And the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Do you have wine involved in the story of John the Baptist? We studied this. Yeah, Herod was drunk. Do you have wine involved in the story of Jezebel in the Old Testament? Yes. You remember the Naboth's vineyard? Absolutely. Now let me ask you, do the three angels message, messages speak about a separation, final separation between the righteous and the unrighteous, between those who have the seal of God and those who receive the mark of the beast? Is there going to be a judgment separation where there will be only two groups? Like in the days of Elijah. If the Lord is God, worship Him. If Baal is God, worship Him. Make your choice. You cannot be on the fence. In Revelation do we find the same idea? Absolutely. Because Revelation presents two groups. One group has the seal of God and the other group has what? The other group has the mark of the beast. In other words, as in the days of Elijah there was a separation and a judgment, Revelation also speaks about a separation and a judgment. Now let me ask you, how much effect has the message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church really had upon the world? You know, maybe we are 15 or 16 million out of a world that has close to 7 billion. Very little effect. You remember in the days of Elijah when he preached the message, even on Mount Carmel, the Bible says that they answered him not a word. Let me ask you, is the day coming when that's going to change? When the whole earth is going to be illumined with the glory of God like Mount Carmel was illumined by the glory of God? Absolutely. Let's read about it in Revelation chapter 18 and verses 1 through 5. This is a global Mount Carmel. The glory of God will fall from heaven once again. The whole Christian world will hear the message about the fall of Babylon, false worship, trampling on the commandments of God, keeping the wrong day, and then 
many of them will do like Israel said, the Lord He is God, the Lord He is God. Notice, after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority and the earth was illuminated with His glory. Was Mount Carmel illuminated with the glory of God? Oh absolutely, but this is a global illumination of planet earth. Notice verse 2, and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen. How many parts does Babylon have? Three, right? This is rebuking the three. Kings of the earth, the harlot, and the harlot's daughters. The dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Verse 2, and he cried mightily with a loud voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. For all the nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich through the abundance of her luxury. And now notice what this call contemplates. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, ye atheists! No, that's not what it says. It says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Is there going to be a battle, once again, between Elijah and this threefold union? Absolutely. In fact, let's read Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 17. It says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring, or with the remnant of her seed, who keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Question, are God's people going to have to flee? You think? Is there going to be a lack of rain on planet earth? Spiritually speaking? Is there going to be a drought? Absolutely! Who's going to be blamed? God's people. Are they going to have to flee? Where? To the desolate places of the earth. In fact, let's read it in the Gospel of Matthew. By the way, the Gospel of Matthew is speaking about this same time period. If you look at the sequence of events in Matthew chapter 24. Notice Matthew 24 and verses 6 through 9. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Are there going to be calamities in society? Just like in the days of Elijah. Absolutely. Verse 8. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And then who's going to be blamed for all of these things? Notice verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and what? And kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Why are they going to be hated? Because the, the wicked think that they are causing what? All of these problems in society, famines and pestilences and earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Will God have to flee? Absolutely. God's people have to flee? Yes. Matthew 24 beginning with verse 15. This is describing the very same time period of the tribulation. It says in Matthew 24 verse 15, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea, what? Flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And now notice this. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. What day is going to be kept when God's people are fleeing? The Sabbath. 
And later on we're going to do a series on Matthew 24 and I'm going to show you that Matthew 24 has two fulfillments. It has a fulfillment with literal Jerusalem but it also has a fulfillment with spiritual Jerusalem at the end of time. Notice verse 21. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time no nor ever shall be. So are God's people going to have to flee? They're going to have to flee. Because the world is going to believe that all of the calamities that are taking place are due to God's remnant. And therefore they will want to slay God's people. You say, this is ridiculous, this could never happen. Folks, it's happened. It's happened during the Middle Ages. It's happened more recently. I could tell you stories of when we moved on to Colombia in the early 1950s. There was religious persecution which was incredible. And we're talking the 20th century here. Will God's people be sustained miraculously by God when they flee? Great Controversy, page 629. Notice this remarkable statement. The people of God will not be free from suffering during this time when they have to flee like Elijah. Those are my words. I quote again. But while persecuted and distressed, while they endure privation and suffer for want of food, they will not be left to perish. That God who cared for Elijah will not pass by one of his self-sacrificing children. He who numbers the hairs of their head will take care for them. And in time of famine they shall be satisfied. While the wicked are dying from hunger and pestilence angels will shield the righteous and supply their wants. Just like in the days of Elijah, God's people will be provided for. Is there going to be a death decree uttered against God's people? Revelation chapter 13 and verse 15, was there a death decree uttered against Elijah? Most certainly. Did God protect him from the death decree? Of course. Notice Revelation 13 and verse 15. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast. That the image of the beast, the beast and his image, the mother and the daughters, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be what? To be killed. So God's end time people are going to go through the same experience as Elijah, as both Elijah's. Because they are preaching the three angels messages. Strengthened by the message of the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 18. When the fire of God falls from heaven, multitudes in all of the churches out there are going to join God's remnant people. Now I need to talk to you about the end of Jezebel, the end time Jezebel, the end of the false prophets, and the end of Ahab. Do you remember what happened in the Old Testament story? How did the prophets of Baal end up? The very people who admired them most arose to slay them. What happened to Ahab? He was killed and the dogs licked up, licked up his blood. What happened to Jezebel? She was thrown down from upstairs, right? She was thrown down. And when she fell, a chariot ran over here, her and the Bible says that her blood splattered on the horses. It's terrible. And then when they came to, to look for her, almost her whole body had been devoured by wild beasts. Is that the scenario of what's going to happen to those who fight against God's people in the end time? Listen to this statement that we find in the book Great Controversy. If I had time I would uh, look at Revelation chapter 16 verse 12, the drying up of the Euphrates. See the harlot sits on many waters, she controls the multitudes of the world, of the world. But the Bible says that the that the waters are going to be what? Dried up. That means that the waters are going to withdraw their what? Their support. And then they're going to arise to destroy the system that deceived them. Notice this remarkable comment in Great Controversy 655 and 656. The people see that they have been deluded. This is at the moment of the sixth plague. 
They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now in their despair these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. Read what happened at Mount Carmel after the fire fell from heaven. How the people felt towards those who had deceived them. She continues saying this, the multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. Do you remember the end of Jezebel? The king came in his chariot and Jezebel said, hey here's another king, Jehu, I'm going to use him the way I used Ahab. And so she, ta she talks to him from the, from the uh, uh, window, she says, oh how are you Jehu? And Jehu says, who's on the Lord's side, who? And two of the servants that were up there, what did they do? They pushed her out the window. In other words, the king no longer was going to be used. He turned against the harlot. Notice Revelation chapter 17, verses 16 and 17. What's going to happen with this harlot? It says, in the ten horns, by the way, the ten horns are king, ten kings. The number ten represents the kings of, of the earth and of the whole world. And the ten horns which you saw on the beast, these will what? Will hate the harlot, just like Jehu, and make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire. And by the way, are the wicked going to be trampled upon by horses, symbolically speaking? Notice Revelation chapter 14. See, the book of Revelation picks up all of this terminology from the Old Testament, and it's speaking about a global universal fulfillment of it. See, it's, it's not one king who is going to turn against a literal harlot queen. It is all of the kings of the world that are going to turn against this harlot system which has deceived them and used them. It's not only literal Israel taking 450 prophets and slaying them, it's going to be all of the ministers of the world that are going to be sought out by all of those who have been deceived by them. Now notice Revelation 14 verses 19 and 20. Revelation 14 verses 19 and 20. It's a serious thing to be a preacher. Hello? Because, so, because if I'm teaching you falsely, you say, oh, he preaches so nice. Hallelujah! Wow! And I deceive you? Someday you're going to look for me, not to pat me on the back, but to want to destroy me, because I've deceived you. It's a serious thing to be a spiritual leader. It's a serious thing to be a teacher of the Word of God. We have to be faithful to the Word. Revelation 14, 19 and 20, saw the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. By the way the grapes and the winepress represent the wicked. And now notice verse 20, and the winepress was trampled outside the city. This means that the wicked now are destroyed. The winepress represents the place where the wicked are. You're not dealing with literal grapes. And the winepress was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the winepress. And now notice this, up to what? The horse's bridles. Does the blood splatter on the horse's bridles? Yes. By the way, do you know who's riding these horses? Revelation 19 identifies those who are riding these horses as Jesus Christ riding on a white horse and the armies in heaven followed him on white horses. And they are coming to destroy the wicked who have persecuted the people of God. Now what about the birds and the beasts eating Jezebel and licking up the blood of Ahab? 
you know this is this is terrible terminology you say wow how can this even be in the Bible let me tell you God uses graphic terminology because he doesn't want us to be in this in these groups he wants us to escape this is a message of love so oh don't talk about about the beast and the false prophet and the mark of the beast that's scary stuff let's talk about love well this is a message of love the reason why God talks to you this way is because he doesn't want you to be in these groups is that a message or would you rather have God say everything's fine just love and then you're lost you say Lord why didn't you tell me well you wanted a message of love notice Revelation 19 17 and 18 what's going to happen with the wicked the terminology that is used you're picking up the ideas from the Old Testament Elijah story it says there in verse 17 then I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried with a loud voice saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven come and gather together for the supper of the great God that you may eat the flesh of kings the flesh of captains the flesh of mighty men the flesh of horses and of those who sit on them and the flesh of all people free and slave both small and great do you remember that in the Old Testament after all of these apostate systems were destroyed we found that verse in 2 Kings 9 verse 7 where it says that God had avenged the blood of his prophets and his servants notice Revelation chapter 19 and verses 1 and 2 Revelation 19 1 and 2 see the book of Revelation picks up on this story of the Old Testament and universalizes it Revelation 19 1 and 2 after these things I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying Alleluia salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God for true and righteous are his judgments because he has what? judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has what? avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her Revelation 18 verse 20 uses the same terminology rejoice over her O heaven and you holy apostles and prophets for God has avenged you on her the book of Revelation is picking up on the Old Testament story but it is universalizing this and after these systems come to their end or at the time that they come to their end then you will see that cloud remember the cloud that Elijah saw there was a delay he had to go seven times the servant to see and there was no cloud no cloud finally he sees that cloud about about the size of a man's hand listen to great controversy 640 and 641 soon there appears in the east a small black cloud about half the size of a man's hand it is the cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness the people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man in solemn silence they gaze upon it as it draws nearer to the earth becoming lighter and more glorious until it is a great white cloud its base a glory like consuming fire and above it the rainbow of the covenant Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror allow me to read another statement of Ellen White about when Jesus actually is near the earth and he can be seen this is great controversy page 645 and then I'm going to show you where she's coming from in the Bible she says speaking about when the angels come she says on each side of the cloudy chariot are wings so God is, Jesus is going to come in a chariot according to this on each side of the cloudy chariot are wings and beneath it are living wheels what's this a chariot with wheels what was it that came to pick up Elijah hello a chariot with wheels and as the chariot rolls upward she continues saying the wheels cry holy ah the wheels are angels and the wings as they move cry holy and the retinue of angels cry holy 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 Lord God Almighty and the redeemed shout hallelujah as the chariot moves outward onward toward the New Jerusalem this is speaking about the ascension to heaven but in order to go up it has to what? it has to come down you say now I thought Jesus was going to come with clouds of angels what's this about a chariot? well do you know that the Bible speaks about God's angels being his chariots? not a Psalm 68 and verse 17 Psalm 68 verse 17 
the chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. What are God's chariots? His what? His angels. By the way, do you remember that when they, were, when they wanted to kidnap Elisha because God was showing him always what the king of Syria was doing? So he said, we need to kidnap this guy so that he doesn't uh, give away, you know, our position and so on. Notice 2 Kings chapter 6 and verse 17. Interesting. And Elisha prayed and said, because they came, surrounded the city, and there looked, it looked like Elisha was going to be taken away. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. That is of his servant. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw... And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What were those chariots of fire? Angels. What came to rescue Elijah at the end of his ministry? A chariot of fire. What will come to rescue God's people at the very end of time? The chariot of God. The chariot of Ezekiel chapter 1, where it speaks about wheels and God sitting on his throne, surrounded by all of the heavenly hosts. The Apostle Paul describes this in 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and thus we shall always be with the Lord are you look for, looking forward to that day? I am I can hardly wait homesick for heaven